And uh, he was a young man when he was uh, taken into captivity, and we're going to see all of that in just a little bit. But Brian Chappell begins his sermon called The Undefiled with this story, and it's a powerful story. It really helps us to understand this passage of Scripture today and the pursuit of holiness. He says this, When I was in seminary, the wife of one of my classmates worked as a quality control inspector at a pharmaceutical company downtown in order to support the family. One day, through mistaken procedures, a major order of syringes was contaminated and would not pass inspection. When the wife of the, my friend reported the contamination to her boss, he quickly computed the costs of reproducing the order and made a quote-unquote cost-effective decision, ship the order. He ordered her to sign the inspection clearance despite the contamination she refused. Because of government regulations, my friend's wife was the only one who could sign the clearance. The syringes did not ship that day, so the next day, a Friday, the wife got a visit from the company president. <clears throat> he said he would give her the weekend to think it over, but if the forms were not signed on Monday, her job would be in jeopardy. In fact, much more was in jeopardy. This inspection job was this couple's only means of support. The husband's education and ministry future was also in jeopardy. All their hopes, dreams, and family plans, uh, plans of many years could be shattered as a result of a choice to be made over the next two days. For this young couple, all the abstract doctrinal instruction they had been receiving about personal consecration, world transformation, and credible witness boiled down to this one very real decision. Could they afford to remain undefiled from the contamination the world was arguing, urging them, I'm sorry, to approve. Was the witness of holiness worth what it would cost? <clears throat> so the couple's predicament, of course, was not unique to them. In all ages, God's people are pressured to pollute the purity of their dedication to God. The pressures come from lots of potential sources, bosses, finances, competitors, friends, relatives, congregations, our own decisions, our desires for success and significance. This couple faced such pressures. You have faced them. Daniel and his friends faced them. The pressures face anyone who will seek to live undefiled in a world of sin. And so this couple was going to have to decide whether or not to follow what they were taught by their parents, their church, and the seminary where he was attending. And when it comes to tough decisions, we most often return to what we were taught our character. So I think about character traits that my parents helped to develop in me. Trustworthiness, a hard work ethic, honesty, loyalty, tithing, faith in God, prayer, so much more. Years ago at a national conference uh, for the United Brethren in Christ, uh, former Bishop Phil Whipple was sharing about hiring staff, and he shared that um, if two candidates were equally qualified, he was going to choose the one that had character qualities that were already developed because he said, I can teach them the skills that they need to do. I, it takes a long time, and it's a much more difficult to teach character when other characters have been developed over the years. So he's like, I'm going to hire someone who already has character developed, <clears throat> the character traits that he's looking for instead of those that, with the skills. So what skills have you learned? What character traits were you taught, good or bad? I want you to just think about those today. So the skills that, that you've learned, the character traits that you um, were taught. Daniel and his friends were taught some pretty incredible character traits that stuck with them even when they were separated from their families. One of the main character traits that they had learned was a firm commitment to God. They also learned what holiness meant and how to maintain that. And from Daniel's example in this passage today, we're going to learn our big idea, which is holiness begins with a firm commitment to God. And so as we just contemplate that big idea today, would you bow your heads with me as we just spend a little time in prayer? Lord, we come to you today excited that we can learn about pursuing holiness from your word and the example of Daniel. I pray, Lord God, that you would open our hearts and minds through your Holy Spirit to the message that you have for us today. Lord, the incredible thing is that your Holy Spirit can speak to each heart and mind in different ways through the same message, and I ask that he would do that today in just a powerful way. That, Lord God, you would transform us to be like your son, Jesus. And I pray, Lord God, that, again, as, a, as just your messenger, as your... Um, 
a cracked and chipped vessel, would you still use me in spite of my weaknesses, in spite of my failures, Lord God? That your people would hear your voice today and be transformed by it. And so we just ask this in your precious son's name. Amen. The four main points you're going to see today, the headings, come from Kenneth Gangle. Uh, he just does an excellent job of providing the main points and headings from the Holman Old Testament commentary. And so uh, I use those main points, but the body is, has been mine, except for the areas that are quoted. But, so he says, attack of Babylon, and every one of these headings has Babylon in it. So verses 1 and 2, we see this attack by Babylon. So if you have your Bibles, Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, this is what God's Word says. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put in the treasure house of his God. And so we see this attack um, by Babylon. Two things under this we're going to see is Jehoiakim's reign and Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Jehoiakim was the son of King Josiah. That's important. If you remember anything about King Josiah, he was... um, the king who returned the Israelites to the worship of God. He was one of just a few kings that we see in the Old Testament scriptures who were, who were righteous and did what was right before God. The vast majority of the other kings that Israel had were wicked, horribly wicked, including Josiah's sons, as we're going to see in just a moment. After Josiah's death, his younger son, Jehoahaz, was actually made king first before Jehoiakim. But his reign only lasted three months. He was a wicked king. So Pharaoh Necho appointed Eliakim, Josiah's old elder son, as king and renamed him Jehoiakim. So that's, you know, the elder son who should have been, you know, the king after Josiah wasn't, uh, but eventually was. So after just three months. And so we see the year of Jehoiakim's reign. Daniel says it was in the third year of Jehoiakim's reign that this, uh, this uh, episode takes place. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 1, says it was in the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign. So which is correct? Right? And some people who say that the Bible isn't inerrant, but there's fallacies there. Well, they, they pick up on this really quickly and go, see, I told you it's not right. It's, it, it's not correct. Guess what? Both of them are correct. Daniel and Jeremiah are both correct. And you're like, okay, Stuart, now you've lost it. You've lost your mind. What do you mean? Let me explain. There are two different calendars that they're working off of. Daniel is working off the Jewish calendar, which began in September and October. Jeremiah was working off a Babylonian calendar, which began in March and April. So two different calendars, but that's not all. It's two different ways of accounting the number of years that someone reigned. The Babylonian reckoning, which was Daniel, they considered the first year of a king's reign the year of a session, and the second year would be the official first year. That's what Gangle says in his commentary. So that first year that uh, Jehoiakim was king wasn't considered his first year. That was the year of accession. And then the Egyptian reckoning, which would have been Jeremiah, they considered the first year as the actual first year of his reign. So Jeremiah says he reigned four years. Daniel says he reigned three years. They're both correct. (laughs) God's word isn't inerrant. It's perfect. We can trust in his word. So Jehoiakim had been king for four years by Egyptian timing, three years by Babylonian timing. And we see Nebuchadnezzar's reign then. Jeremiah 25.1 tells us that it was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign that he besieged Jerusalem. And so it was 605 BC when Nebuchadnezzar became king and he didn't waste time establishing his dominance in the region. He went out by September of that year and began to just defeat all the nations around him. And he was feared, greatly feared within that region. And while Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was ultimately, ultimately in control, we see the almighty sovereign God who is actually in control. Do you see it there? It says, in God's sovereignty and under his control, he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to overtake Jerusalem and delivered King Jehoiakim into his hands. 
I love that. These kings are all like, yeah, we're doing this, man, all right, yeah. You know, I like Pharaoh with, with Moses. And, yeah, we, you know, I'm in control. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not in control. God is in control because God is sovereign. That's our first principle today. Nothing happens outside his divine control and purpose. And this is the first time in the passage that we're looking at today that we see God's sovereignty, but it's not the last. We'll see it come up one more time. God is still in control of world-changing and nation-changing events. And we're reminded of it this week. Whatever our political views are, we can trust that God is in control. Whatever our beliefs are about a worldwide pandemic, God is in control. Whatever financial, financial struggles we're experiencing, either personally or as a church, God is in control. How many of us would say that we feel like we're being taken ca- captive emotionally, spiritually, politically, relationally, financially? Maybe you're feeling that way today. How many of us would say that we feel like some of our most prized possessions are being carried away? You know, when the economy is bad, you might feel that way about your retirement plan, right? This, well, that's one of my prized possessions is being carried away. Perhaps most of us can relate to what the Israelites were feeling at this point. We may not be going into captivity and being carried away to another land physically, but perhaps that's how we feel emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. We may be experiencing the feelings of hopelessness in our culture right now. And God is with us, and he promises to never leave us or forsake us, but to be our helper. That's what the writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. We can trust him. He's in control. He's sovereign. And so that leads us to the first next step today. I just want to encourage you with, and that's to trust in God's sovereign power and turn to him with my feelings of hopelessness. You might be feeling just like the Israelites were. Nebuchadnezzar has come in. He has taken control. He's taken the best and the brightest into captivity, left the poor and desolate back in Jerusalem, and people might just be feeling hopeless. And maybe that's the way you're feeling today about politics, about uh, health, about finances, you name it, whatever it is you're going through. You might just feel hopeless today. But God's in control. God also allowed some of the articles from his temple to be carried away to Babylon. Gangle says, Daniel tells us that twice in one verse tells us this twice in one verse, indicating its importance. He wants us to understand that this is not only a battle between nations, but also a battle between deities. God against Marduk, the great God of the Babylonians. And this spiritual battle wages to the very end of time. Do you realize that is still going on today? And if you look into the book of Revelation, when we study the book of Revelation, where do we see, what do we see again here? Babylon. We see the term Babylon popping up again. This is a continual spiritual battle that's taking place until the end of time. We see it here in the Old Testament, in the ancient times, in through the New Testament, into our day and age. And so it's frustrating, isn't it? But God's in control. The temple in Babylonia would have been to Bel, which is also Marduk, And the purpose in carrying away some of the articles from the temple was to prove that the deities of Babylonia had conquered the God of Judah. (laughs) That they were so wrong. (laughs) That's what they thought in their humanness, right? Yeah, we defeated Judah uh, and Jerusalem, and we're taking the articles from their, uh, their God's temple to prove that Marduk is more powerful. Oh, but you're so wrong. And Nebuchadnezzar left some of the articles in the temple so that the Israelites who remained in Jerusalem could continue to worship their God. You see, he wasn't trying to completely wipe them out. He was trying to re-educate some of them. But they were going to become a vassal state to Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar didn't only take articles from the temple of the Lord, but he also took young men from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so we see the training in Babylon. That's our second point today. Look at verses 3 to 7. We see these words. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, 
chief of his court officials, to bring him some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. <laughs> Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. And so we see here um, that these young men are taken into captivity. So who was to be trained? Nebuchadnezzar puts the chief of his court officials, Ashpenaz, in charge of choosing those who will be taken into captivity and trained. So this was common practice in the ancient world, taking the brightest and the best of the royal family and the nobility into captivity and training them so that they would eventually become advocates for the conquering nation with their own people. See, it was a brainwashing thing that was going on so that when they would send them back to, to kind of rule over this vassal state, they would be like, Babylon's awesome. It's amazing. Nebuchadnezzar is the best, right? That's what they were attempting to do. Through all this, it was a common practice. We see the attributes of, the, of those that were chosen, physically and intellectually. Physically, they were young, without defect, handsome. And I just have to say, and I'm a little biased, I think my boys would qualify. <laughs> They'd get carried away to captivity. Um, yeah, young men, um, youths or children, Daniel and his friends would have been around 12 to 15 years old. Now, I want you to keep that age range in mind because that's going to be really important as we get into Daniel's, um, what, what he resolves. So think about his age, 12 to 15 years old. Intellectually, they had aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand. Again, I might be a little biased, but I think my boys would qualify. When they put their mind to something, they, they're pretty good at, at learning what they want to learn. And I think that every one of us as parents would say the same thing of our own children. They would qualify physically and intellectually. Now that we know who was to be trained, we can focus on what they were to be taught. We see here that it was the language and literature of the Babylonians. Now we know the language um, because we know it just from um, writings outside of the Bible. We know what the, what the language was of ancient Babylon. Um, in the IVP Bible background commentary, it says this, the traditional language of Babylon was Akkadian, a complex and ancient language written by means of a cuneiform script using a stylus to make wedge-shaped characters in which each symbol represented a syllable. And so here's what cuneiform uh, looks like. Uh, that one's a little hard to see perhaps, but um, if you look at it, I think it's the next slide. This is kind of the cuneiform. So they're making different shapes and each of those represented a syllable. While the Babylonians knew Akkadian, they primarily communicated using Aramaic, which was similar to Hebrew, in that it used an alphabetic script instead of a cuneiform script. And so Daniel and his friends may have already known Aramaic. And so you see the Aramaic alphabet here, and it uses an alphabet. I think it's 22 letters. I can't remember. Yeah, 22. And then here's what Hebrew looks like in its alphabet. So they, it would have been easier for them to learn Aramaic and may have already known Aramaic at this point. Now, when it comes to literature, there are certainly all kinds of general literature for these young men to learn, from the sciences to mathematics to um, astrology uh, to psychology, all that kind of stuff. They were learning. Uh, they could have learned all of that, but perhaps they were taught specific forms of literature based on how they were going to serve the Babylonian kingdom. Now, we know that Daniel served as a diviner because God had given him the ability to understand visions and dreams of all kinds. We're going to see that in verse 17 in just a little bit. And it's probable that Daniel focused on the omen literature that would serve him well as a diviner. So he may not have learned all of this other literature primarily. Maybe he did it secondarily, but primarily he was probably focusing on the omen text, the priest text, so because he was going to be this diviner. And we're not really told how the other three youths served the Babylonian kingdom, so it's more difficult for us to determine their course of training. But it wasn't just a 12-week uh, quick course on how to serve the king, but rather a much lengthier training that would completely indoctrinate them to the customs, traditions, and ways of the Babylonian people. 
And so we see that this training, how long was their training? It would take them three years. And after their training was complete, they would serve the king. Every aspect of their lives was regimented and set by the king, what they were to learn and what they were to eat. And so we see that here. What were they to eat? The king assigned a daily portion of food and wine from his own table. And we shouldn't see this. That king Nebuchadnezzar wasn't trying to defile the Israelites here. He was giving them the best from his table. And so the king probably just didn't even know about their dietary restrictions as Israelites. He was providing that best that he had to offer. Remember, the purpose in their training was to transform those who were captive from their original origins to Babylonian citizens. So he's not trying to hurt them. He's not trying to defile them. He wasn't trying to starve them or anything like that. He was giving them good food. We only learn later that Daniel and his three friends considered a food and wine something that would defile them. We're not told the exact food items that were part of their daily portion, but perhaps it included bread and meat of some kind, and definitely wine. Captives weren't the only ones who received a daily portion from the king's table. Ranking members of the administration, craftsmen, artisans, both native and foreign, diplomats, businessmen, and entertainers. Of those who were taken captive, we see that some of them were from Judah. This is important because Ju Judah is the line of, uh, of the king. So this is the line of the king. And again, if you look back in verse 3, um, he's talking about taking those from the royal family and those from uh, those uh, also what's it, from nobility. That's the word I'm trying to think of. So <clears throat> you have all of these, and they have their Hebrew names. And I just want to tell you what their Hebrew names mean because it's significant for their Babylonian names as well. Daniel means God is judge. Hananiah means Jehovah is gracious or whom Jehovah has favored. Mishael means who, who is what God is. And Azariah means the Lord helps. Now, to change someone's name is to exercise authority over them and their destiny. That comes from the IVP Bible background commentary. So Belteshazzar, which was Daniel, means Bel's or Marduk's prince, he whom Bel favors. And Bel was the chief god, Marduk. Or Bel, the same guy, the uh, same deity, chief god. Shadrach uh, was Hananiah, and it means young friend of the king or c command of Aku, which would have been the sun or moon god. Meshach was Mishael. They didn't, he, you know, the official here didn't spend a lot of time working on that one. He just changed a couple of things. It means who is what Aku is instead of who is what God is. And it could also be from the Babylonian goddess Shishak shortened to Shak, which was the earth god. And then Abednego, which is Azariah, it means servant of Nebo, serv servant of the shining fire. <clears throat> and so the fire of God. So Daniel and his three friends, along with the other captives, were gonna, going through a lot of changes all at once. And Daniel accepted all the changes but one. Look at verses 8 to 14 with me, because this is the third point, commitment in Babylon. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself uh, with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should, you, why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel uh, then asked the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. So we see Daniel's resolution here. Daniel made up his mind. That's what it means to make this to be resolved, that he would not eat the royal food or drink the wine. Now, why did he make up his mind about food and drink, but not a, a, about the name change or the curriculum that he was going to learn? Well, having his name changed and learning what the customs, traditions, and ways of the Babylonian people uh, were did not directly go against Jewish law. Eating food prepared by Gentiles would have made the food unclean. It would not have been kosher. It would have defiled them. The food might have been sacrificed to idols, and eating it would have meant approval of the worship of those gods or those deities. So again, they... In, in uh, idol worship, we even see it within uh, worship of God. 
in the Old Testament that they would pour out wine. And so again, even though not all of it was used in that ritual, it would have been wine used to, in the worship of idols. And so for a couple of reasons, Daniel's like, I have to draw the line here. Okay, you can change my name. That's not a big deal. Um, that doesn't mean that I am Marduk's uh, friend or whatever. That doesn't mean any of that to me. And this curriculum you're teaching me, okay, that's great. I can use it in the future somehow probably. But, but I can't defile myself with the food. We see that he has this firm commitment to God. And so holiness begins with a firm commitment to God. That's our big idea today. Where did Daniel learn this firm commitment to God? He would have been alive during King Josiah's reign. He would have been a young fella, but he would have seen and experienced the repentant heart of not only the king, but everyone else in Jerusalem. And perhaps he watched his father and mother recommit themselves to the Lord. He saw firsthand the transformation that God's word had in his own family. And they would have continued to teach him those principles as, king, as Josiah was king. He was wholly committed to the Lord and would not sacrifice that commitment by eating food and drinking wine, potentially sacrificed to idols. I like this quote from Alexander McLaren. He says this, The great lesson from the incident in this incident is that religion should regulate the smallest details of life and that it is not narrow overscrupulousness, but fidelity to the highest duty. When a man sets his foot down about any small matter and says, no, I dare not do it, little as it is, and pleasant as it might be to sense, because I should thereby be mixed up in a practical denial of my God. So did not I, because of the fear of God, is a motto which will require from many a young man abstinence from many things which it would be much easier to accept. Isn't that true of us today? It's like, oh, it's just so much easier to accept what the, our culture is saying is okay. Instead of, no, saying, uh-uh, I'm putting my foot down on this one. These things that, that our laws have passed and say are okay are not okay by God's laws. They're not okay. I'm putting my foot down. And I'm not going <clears> to <throat> be a part of that at all. And it may be just something simple for us. But it's profound, isn't it? That's what holiness is all about. Holiness begins with a firm commitment to God. We need to know where we stand with God. We need to understand his word and what his word says. So that leads us to principle number two, is that God is pleased when we choose holiness over worldliness. So we're being bombarded every day with temptations for worldliness. Perhaps our employer is asking us to do something that we know is not morally or ethically right, perhaps even legal, it might be illegal that they're asking us to do, what will we choose? Maybe a friend at school wants us to help them do something that we know isn't right. What will we choose? Some of us may have family members who are pressuring us to do something wrong. What will we choose? A fellow college student or professor may be encouraging us to be more tolerant of a social or cultural shift that's in opposition to God's word. What will we choose? Society wants us to be tolerant of other religions and cultural, quote-unquote, cultural norms that go against the Bible. What will we choose? Laws within our land, like abortion, same-sex marriage, legalization of drugs, etc., the list could go on and on, tempt us to accept what God says is unacceptable. What will we choose? And so the next, second next step today might be for you, is it to resolve to stand firm on my commitment to God and choose holiness over worldliness. That's my desire for you. That's Mark, Pastor Mark and I's desire. That's why we really felt this uh, calling to, to encourage you all with, with four messages about per, the pursuit of holiness. We have to do that. We have to be different than our culture, than our world. That's the only way that they're going to see that there's a need of a Savior that they need to be transformed, that they have hope for the future. And what I like about this, and as I mentioned earlier, Daniel and his three friends were probably in their early teens, <clears throat> but they were committed to God at a young age. They were pursuing holiness because of a firm commitment to God. And these four young men seem to be the exception among the captives, but they uh, are an incredible example for our young people today. 
The norm too often in our day and age is that young men and women in their early teens are not pursuing holiness and a firm commitment to God. And we often hear them say that they'll pursue God and holiness when they're older. Many young people who have walked away from the church and the Lord in their mid to uh, late uh, teens and early 20s return to the Lord and the church when they begin having children. (laughs) because they know the importance of it. They're returning to their roots. They understand that they want their children to know who God is. This doesn't have to be the norm. I was at a pastor's meeting yesterday, and um, the the church where I was at over in York Springs, uh, they do an after-school tutoring program. And um, around Christmas time, they had some of the children come in, and they started to talk to them about, you know, what Christmas meant and how it was connected to Jesus. And they had no idea. They had no idea that Christmas was about Jesus and the reason that he came from heaven to earth. That's our culture. I mean, we have people, children going up in families that aren't going to church. They've never heard the, the one Bible story. And see, that's our norm, but it doesn't have to be the norm. Young people can and should be pursuing holiness and a firm commitment to the Lord. The primary teaching and modeling for pursuing holiness should come from dad and mom. But like I said, they, they learn from our teaching and our example, but certainly there's young people living in a non-Christian home, but they're striving for, to live for Jesus. And that's when the body of Christ steps in and provides the teaching and modeling for these young people to follow. Young people today, listen, you don't have to wait you don't have to be, you're not going to miss something really great in this culture and in our world by pursuing holiness and a, and a deep commitment to the Lord. You're going to miss maybe some hard heartache and some difficulties that you don't even have to go through because you're in a relationship with God. You're fully committed to him. You're pursuing holiness. And I think it's, we have this, misconception about heaven and that it's not going to be as great as something here on earth, that we're going to miss something here on earth if we don't pursue and sow our oats and do whatever it is and enjoy this culture and this life. Man, oh man, you have a misconception of heaven and what heaven's going to be like. It's going to far outweigh anything, any joy that you're going to experience here. Anything that you think is going to bring you the greatest joy on earth is going to fail in comparison to heaven. And so you can pursue holiness now. And that's my challenge for our young people. That's the third next step today for the young people is not wait until I'm older to pursue holiness in a personal relationship with God. Start now. Impact your culture for the, and your generation for Christ. And then the fourth next step is for us as adults and is to commit to teach and model a life of holiness for the next generation. They need good teachers that are pursuing holiness. They need good uh, people that are just modeling it for them. That's our responsibility. Daniel gives us a great example of how to handle potential conflict, especially when it pertains to defiling our moral and ethical beliefs. He appeals to those in charge. First, he goes to the chief official, and he asks the chief official for permission not to defile himself. And this goes back to principle number one. We see it here again. God is sovereign. He's in control as he causes the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. I love the fact that God's just in control of this whole situation. The chief official understands Daniel's concern about the food and wine, but he isn't ready to choose holiness over worldliness. He, he prefers having his head attached to his shoulders. He's afraid that if he changes what the king has said, that he's going to lose his head. And the chief official wasn't willing to question the king's assignment of food. But that didn't stop Daniel from continuing to appeal. He goes to the guard who has direct supervision over him and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. And his appeal is to have the guard give these four a test run for 10 days. Instead of eating the royal food and drinking the wine, they will eat vegetables and drink water. And after the 10 days are up, the guard can compare their appearance to the appearance of the other captives who have eaten the king's food and wine. And the guard can then treat all of them These four are included based on what he sees. And so the guard agrees to the test. What will happen as a result of these four young men choosing holiness because of their firm commitment to God? Let's find out. We don't have to wait. Let's look at verses 15 to 21. 
We see it right here. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than, than the young men who, had, who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine, and they were, uh, to, they were to drink, and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So we see the blessings in Babylon. Principle three is this. God honors the obedience of his people. We see it here in multiple levels. Multiple blessings. Physically, these four young men looked healthier than the other young men. They also looked more nourished or fatter. Half of the translations say fatter. Now, we don't associate fatter as healthier as a healthy term, right? You're like, oh, he's fat. No, that's not healthy. But um, I just want you to think um, about malnourished children who are only skin and bones. And for them to be well-fed and nourished, it means that they have skin on their bones, right? They're fatter doesn't mean that they're overweight. It just means they look healthy. The guards saw the results and took away the choice food and wine from everyone and gave them all vegetables to eat and probably water to drink. I don't know how the other guys felt. They're like, way to go, Daniel. Now we're all vegan, right? We're all vegetarians now. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Really enjoyed that food. <laughs> and now we got to drink water. <laughs> It wasn't just physical blessings, but intellectual blessings. The intellectual blessings all came from God. You see that again? His sovereignty we see again. All four men received knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Daniel also received the ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. It didn't matter what the king questioned them about as it pertained to wisdom and understanding. These four young men were ten times more capable of providing a balanced answer than all the other magicians and enchanters in the kingdom. Wow, that's because of the power of God. That's because of the pursuit of holiness. That's because God honors the obedience of his people. They also had, uh, so that's pretty incredible blessings from the Lord for pursuing holiness and a firm commitment to him, but they also had employment blessing. These four young men were given positions within the kingdom. They had uh, completed their three years of training and were ready to serve the Lord by serving the king of Babylon. Daniel remained as an official in the Babylonian kingdom until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, you may look at that and go, oh, great, what does that mean? <laughs> he was in the service of the king for almost the entire 70 years of captivity. That's pretty significant. He, Daniel served under four kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian Empire, Belshazzar, his son in the Babylonian Empire, King Darius in the Medo-Persian Empire, and then Cyrus in the Medo-Persian Empire. And Cyrus is the, is the king who then set the Israelites free and sent them back to Jerusalem. So what blessings have you received as a result of obeying God? I want you to just think about that for a minute. Let that sink in. What blessings have I received as a result of being obedient to God? The flip side of that is true as well. How has God disciplined me when, as his child, I've chosen not to be obedient to him. So we can think about that as well. As we just review today, are you feeling hopeless? Trust God because he's sovereign, he's in control. I want to encourage you to resolve to stand firm on your commitment to God and choose holiness over worldliness. And young people don't wait to pursue holiness in a relationship with God. The blessing far outweigh the hardship. And as a body of believers... As parents and adults, we are called to teach and model a life of holiness and a firm commitment to God. For Daniel and his three friends, holiness and a firm commitment to God didn't stop with this one difficult situation. They, they were hit up with more difficult situations. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose holiness over worldliness and experienced a supernatural firewalk and a promotion. Remember the story? It's in Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 to 30. Daniel has 
just interpreted a dream for the king about this great statue and what it all represents, the different materials that we used. And I, King Nebuchadnezzar probably thought, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Let's build a, let's build a big statue of me so that people can worship me. And he does. So he builds this big, huge statue, and then he gathers all the people together, and, and, he, and he has all the musical instruments there, and he t- tells the people, when you hear the sound of all the musical instruments, you are to fall down and worship this, uh, you know, this image of me that I've erected. And everybody does. The sound of all the music starts. Everybody falls down, but Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so the, somebody goes to them and says, hey, you know those guys you know, from, you know, from Judah, from Jerusalem? You guys, they didn't bow down. Uh, do you want to talk to them? Yeah, I do. And so he calls them in and he says to them, hey, I noticed that you guys didn't bow down when all the musical instruments were played. I'm going to give you a second chance. So when you hear the sound of the instruments again, if you fall down and worship me, then everything's good. If not, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And so the, you know, their answer is, Hey, uh, that's okay. We're not going to bow down to you or your image. And even if God doesn't save us from the fiery furnace, we're still going to follow him. Wow. And we know the story, right? The guards that take them up to the fiery furnace and throw them all die because of the heat. Because he's, he's turned the temperature up really, really high. And then they're standing there watching these guys. And Nebuchadnezzar is like... How many, how many people do we throw in there? Three. Well, it looks like there's four. And one's like shining like the sun. It's incredible. And then he calls into him and says, hey, you guys, get out here. And they come out. And I think this is incredible. They don't even smell like smoke. Their hair isn't singed. Their garments aren't singed. Nothing is singed. They come out just like they went in. Not even smelling like smoke. So they held, on, they held on to this holiness and this pursuit of holiness and this commitment, a firm commitment to God. Daniel chose to maintain his firm commitment to God in pursuit of holiness even when there was a 30-day prayer ban decreed by King Darius and he experienced a supernatural slumber party with a den of lions. Think about that, all these soft manes, right? He's laying down with them, hanging out all night. You know the story, right? These guys are like, we can't find anything that's bad in Daniel. So they go to the king and they say, hey, king, um, why don't you make a decree uh, for the Medes and Persians? Because once you make that decree, no one can undo it. And why don't you say that for the the next 30 days that um, nobody should pray to anyone but you? No no other god, uh, no other person, just pray to you. And so King Darius is like, okay, that sounds good. Problem is, is he, he isn't thinking about the ramifications of that over of the bigger picture. And so he makes the decree, and then they just watch Daniel go do what he did every day. And Daniel went home, and he went up into his room, and he prayed three times a day. They go back to the king, and they say, hey, hey King Darius, um, didn't you make this decree, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, but Dan- Daniel has been praying to his own God for the three times a day. And... um. You need to take care of it. And poor Darius is like, oh my goodness. Because Daniel had been a great advisor to him. And he's he's like, there's no way I can get out of this. I can't change the law that I've I've written, the decree that I've written. And so he just says to Daniel, "I, I hope that your God can take care of you. And Daniel's like, don't worry about it. They chuck him in the lion's den. He spends a whole night in there, you know, with these kittens. Well, maybe not kittens, but not a hair on his head is, is injured or hurt. Darius goes out early the next morning. And he says, Daniel, are you still there? He says, Daniel says, yep, God took care of me. He shut the mouth of the lion. I, I, everything's great. And he says, well, get him out of there. And they bring him up out of the lion's den. And then Daniel says, hey, you know those guys that came and talked to you? They were kind of deceptive. And so the king says, okay, we'll bring them and all their family and throw, throw them in the lion's den. And those turkeys, well, those lions, were hungry by this point. And scripture tells us that before they even touched the ground, they were consumed, destroyed. And so my question for you today is, are you ready to experience the supernatural blessings of God as you pursue holiness through a firm commitment to him? That's what he's called us to. And so I encourage you, if you haven't downloaded the Spiritual Life Journal yet, do it today. If you haven't picked one up, pick one up today. 
and begin to f- uh, sign those commitments to the different aspects of holiness and our, our desires that you will pursue holiness this year because I want to see God's blessing in your life. Supernatural blessing. That while others might be struggling and not understand what's going on, we can move forward in his strength and in his power. And so as the worship team comes to close in our closing song, would you just bow your heads with me? Lord, we come to you today. Thank you for your word and the power of it. Thank you for the example of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego.